So, uh, I'm Katie Masores. I'm the Chief Policy Officer for Hacker One. I have the honor of introducing the one and only Charlie Miller. How many of you know Charlie? Awesome. Okay, so Charlie, when did you and I meet? 2000, a decade ago, maybe? A long time ago. Um, but Charlie uh, holds a very special place in my heart among his many, many accomplishments of ponage. Um, he's, he's one of the folks that stood up and, and called out the No More Free Bugs movement. How many of you have heard of that? No More Free Bugs. Um, and then we, we spent a long time talking together, like years, I think, where uh, I kept asking for his counsel and support and help um, in terms of how to structure, you know, what bounty programs might look like at the most reluctant company in the world to do them at the time. Um, but Charlie is going to talk about his profound and deep hatred of InfoSec, and we are going to absorb that hatred like the rays of sunshine that we were absorbing yesterday. Um, <laughs> and that's being treated right now. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, without further ado, Charlie, I will hand it over to you, and uh, thank you so much for closing out the wonderful AppSet Cali Conference. Thanks. So people would call me like once every six months and be like, yo, Charlie, we're going to totally release a bug bounty at Microsoft, and I'd be like, okay, tell me about it again, and then six months would go by. Hey, we're totally going to release a bug bounty at Microsoft now, what do you think? I was like, Great idea. So this is how I basically be. Alright, uh, so anyway, uh, I'm going to tell you why I hate uh, my job, and um, hopefully you guys have some fun. Uh, um, the other thing I want to kind of start out by saying is, uh, not to brag or anything, but I'm a decent public speaker. Um, normally I talk about sort of in-depth research and stuff, and I'm really good at that. Um, I'm a terrible keynote speaker, so unfortunately you guys ended up with that. So uh, the thing that, like I don't really even know what a keynote is supposed to be, um, so like I can get, like I, I did research, I'm going to tell you about it, but um, like, I don't really know what keynotes do, and so the only thing I know is like, I go to conferences a lot, and sometimes they go to the keynote, and from what I can get is they just sort of talk about whatever they feel like, and so that's what this is about. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so uh, this slide is supposed to convince you that, that you should listen to at least pay attention a little bit to what I have to say. Um, and so I've done a bunch of security stuff. Uh, so, so like, why on earth would I hate InfoSec? Well, it's stuff like this that sort of starts off, right? So, um, people don't really get what we do, and like you see movies and, and you know, scorpions TV shows and stuff, and uh, like, that doesn't seem like what I do every day. Um, what I do every day is like not nearly as, as fun or exciting. So, um, I guess I wanted to start out with, I have been doing InfoSec stuff since, for a long time, since like 2000. Um, but really, I, I worked at NSA for five years, and so while you're there, you don't really do And so it wasn't until I left there in 2005 that I started to do research and present conferences and go to conferences and stuff. And so, for me, my like real sort of public InfoSec career began like around 2007. And so I was sort of thinking, like, so, like, uh, what's changed since 2007 in InfoSec? Like, are we better off? Are we, you know, did we do good? Like, what, I've spoken probably a hundred times. Like, how much have I improved InfoSec in all these talks I've given? And, uh, and it's not like we're talking about, you know, curing cancer or something, which you get, it's going to take a while, right? So, InfoSec is a field that moves pretty quick. So, seven years or eight years, however you want to count it, uh, it's quite a long time in our field. So, just to emphasize how long this is in, in technology and IT and that, I, I sort of thought back and it's like, well, like what's changed just in general in 2007? And then we'll talk about like how we've solved all of our problems in seven. So, the first thing is to think about mobile phones. Like, these are the kind of phones that were at the top of the line in 2006. So, there's these crappy little, little phones and, like, you know, like Blackberries. And there's literally, in this article, there's a category called Best phone to do email that's not a BlackBerry because you just assume that BlackBerry was by far the best one. So, like mobile phone security or mobile phones have changed a lot since since you know, yeah. Like yeah. browsers are totally different beasts now. Um, this is top of the line browsers in 2006. So like, 87 just came out. So basically, everyone was using IE6. Like now everyone is using IE6. 
terrible, but at the time, this was, this was like the best of the best. And then likewise, I was using this crappy little Safari. <laughs> so, and there was no such thing as Chrome. So we saw this whole talk about Chrome and how it's designed to secure Chrome and pull around up. It didn't even exist yet. So 2007 was, was a long time ago. And the browsers people used, like we mentioned, were, were way different. So back then, everyone used IE and some people used Firefox. Now, everyone uses Chrome. Still, for some reason, a lot of people use Firefox. And then like, a few people use IE. So it is a totally different landscape than in sort of the browser. And not only are the browsers people use different, but the sites they go to are different. So back then, everyone spent all their time on MySpace. Right? So obviously, that's changed in Yahoo and stuff. And, and like, unlike now, like, oh, no one spends time on Adult Friend Finder back then. Like, what's the deal? Like, shoot, I don't want to on that site. But anyway, the point is, like, things were different back then. Things have changed a lot. Facebook, like, it existed in 2006 and 2007, but it was just a little blip on the radar. Now it's like, uh, Twitter, which is the most awesome social networking site, uh, they didn't even exist in 2006. So the point is, like, from 2007 or 6 or whatever you want to count it to now, uh, it's a long time in our field. Like, a lot of things have changed. We've had a lot of opportunities to improve this, create things, and make a lot of changes to, to, you know, uh, to really lock down our enterprises. But uh, the question is, have we succeeded? What, what's changed from the InfoSec world since 2006 or 7? So, just for fun, I, I, I grabbed uh, some talk titles from Black Hat back in 2007 and then last year. Um, and I was going to compare because, like, you would kind of expect in seven or eight years, like, you would have these old talks that's like, oh, yeah, we totally saw that like two years ago, versus like these new threats that are brand new and never heard of. And so, if you look at these, like, I, I dare you to guess which ones are the ones from 2007 versus the ones from 2014. Um, so, like, over here, you've got things like uh, uh, local exploitation of network drivers traffic analysis, static detection of backdoors. And then over here you've got things about like you know, SQL injection, PDF attacks, CSR attacks. So which one is the one that is, you know, old ancient history? Which one is the one we're still trying to deal with it right now? Any guesses? You can tell by the next are fine. These are the new ones. But that's the only way you can tell. Right? Otherwise it's like the same shit. Oh sorry, forget my language. Um, so it's the same problems. Uh, that we're facing in 2007, we're facing now. We still haven't solved them. We've, like in that sense, conference talks are really no different. They're, they're sort of the same as always. Um, well, yeah, maybe the conferences haven't changed, but the main sort of bottom line in our field is: are people breaking into our sites and stealing our data? And like breaches happened in 2007, they still happen today. Like you don't really see this trending up or down. It's just sort of people breaking all the time. Um, well, what about like vendors and their patches? Have, have we improved? Like, are there way fewer patches now because our software is like, way more secure? And not really. So, uh, I'm, I would say like, you could guess which one of these if you could read it. Um, is, is from 2007 and which one is now. Um, but on the left, you'll see it's talking about Internet Explorer 7, which was like the latest greatest then. Uh, and these are all remote code execution patches. Or patches for remote code execution vulnerabilities in 2007. And over here is one I think from. 2013, which is the last I saw where there was actually like really cool data like this. Um, and again, it's Internet Explorer, so now it's Internet Explorer, like a greater version. And uh, if you look, it says things like, instead of saying remote code execution, now they just say like, exploit code exploit likely, exploit code unlikely, exploit code likely. But anyway, the point is, there's a ton of patches now for IE, there were a ton of patches then, that hasn't changed. So, um, despite like everyone saying Microsoft is awesome, and they are pretty awesome, and they have this great SDLC, and they've got all these engineers. Like, in eight years, it's still like churning out patches that are patches. So, um, it's like a little depressing. Uh, so, so, like, vendors haven't really improved that much, at least not in that one, you know, with the data. Maybe reporters have wised up, and, and now they report on important stuff. Um, so, back in 2007, they were reporting this new story about iPhones and, and this, this unknown security researcher from Young and Handsome, Charlie Miller. Uh, that was New York Times. So now, like, you know, that, despite that headline, like, it's not like iPhones all got broken into, right? So this is sort of what I'm telling you, right? Um, so now, maybe that we've really wised up, maybe you're watching you. It's like, mm, yeah, well, it's a little bit sensational. 
It's not even an example. So headlines still aren't very good. Um, so there's this time test we have own to own, like every every year. And, and you know, like if you win, you get these like sweet shoes, like I have. It's like own to own. Um, but anyway, uh, like maybe this contest, things have changed. Like, you know, it used to be easy, now maybe like no one wins because it's too hard. Well, here's a headline from 2007. Backpack via Safari Browser and Phone Contest. Here's one from uh, last year. Chinese security team exploits Safari security flaw at Phone Contest. It's like every year someone breaks in and someone wins. So are we improving? It's, it's kind of hard to tell. Like, if you just look at these headlines, then we're not improving. It's like every year someone wins. The only difference is instead of one guy like near Dino, it's a team of guys and they're from China. I don't know if that's an improvement or not. <laughs> so the point is, like, have, have we, like, I don't get it. Like, I, like, we worked hard, it seems like, and it seems like we've done stuff, but it doesn't seem like we're any more secure. So uh, it's, it's a little depressing. And it makes me think that when I go to my job and I wonder sort of like, why, you know, what am I doing? Like, what's, what's my role? What, what, why did this company hire me, you know? And so I think, well, uh, maybe my, my job is to keep, keep the company out of the headlines, right? That's what I tell people. Like, my job is to keep, you know, my company out of the headlines. And then I think it's like, well, they probably wouldn't care if there was a problem and they were in the headlines as long as it didn't affect the business, right? So maybe my my actual job isn't to keep us out of the headlines, but to keep like any security incident from causing business harm. Right? Maybe that's my job. Um, so then uh, I was like, well, uh, I can do that. So I did a little research into like whether uh, I myself or people like us are, are having an impact in that. So the question I asked myself was. And I, I use this like, really sophisticated research tool called uh, Yahoo Finance. Um, like, when, when companies have breaches, do you know what? What does the business really care about? Well, you know, stock stock prices are very important. So, like, if you have a breach, do you expect your stock to go down? And like, I don't want there to be a breach where I work because I don't want my stock to go down, right? So, uh, do I? Is, am I doing the right thing by protecting my company? So here is uh, Target. So. The day that Target announced their breach was December 19th, and you can see their stock. And this is a span of like, you know, three months. And so did the stock go down? Well, eventually, like a couple weeks afterwards it went down, but you know, stocks do things. But like immediately, within the next week, it had actually gone up. So it seems like even though they had essentially the worst security incident you could imagine, their stock didn't actually go down, at least not for a while. Well, maybe that was like one incident, right? So I looked around some more. So Home Depot had a big breach. And here is the, the mark when that happened. And you can see it on the bottom like, where all the articles happened. So there was like a ton of articles a day about, oh my god, Home Depot's breached. And look what happened to their stock. Well, again, this time it's over only like a month period. And it went up initially, right? And then it went down a little bit. And then it went up. And it went down. So like, it's not like it, it plummeted. It's not like Home Depot almost went out of business because they had a big breach. Um, so here's another one. Uh, so I said, well, maybe it's not breaches that are important because I don't know why people wouldn't think that's important, but maybe it's something else. And so Adobe had this huge issue where not only did they get breached, but someone stole all their passwords, right? Or at least patches of passwords were breached. So it's like, well, maybe that's the thing that, that like, really matters. And so this happened on October 4th. And you can see here, actually, the stock did go down. Well, and this is the time span is maybe three weeks or something. So they go down initially, but it recovered quite quickly. So, um, so maybe your job in life isn't to protect the company. Your job is to just make the company only suffer for a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I work awful hard to do just that, you know? So uh, one of the things I've learned in my you know, too many years of InfoSec and, and you hear people say this like knowledgeable people, the people who are experts in the field come to you all the time and they'll say, well, you know, Charlie, everything can be hacked. And they're right. Um, and today in talks, I've heard this at least two or three times before. People say, well, everything can be hacked. I'm not ever, I'm not And they're totally right. And so when you see a breach like Target or Home Depot or in my, my hometown, the grocery store chain got hacked, and reporters would be like, hey, Charlie, were they negligent? Did they have good security? Did they have bad security? And I'd be like, I don't know, like, it's, it's certainly, like, my, my instinct tells me they probably suck. 
and, and it, it happened to an emergency. But there's no way to know that. They could have been doing everything right, they were totally locked down, and they still got it. And so from a defender's point of view, it's sort of a drag because no matter how hard you try, you know someone can get in. Um, and something people don't think about all the time is it's actually kind of drag from an attacker's perspective, too. So uh, as a researcher, like a lot of my job as researchers is sort of like find laws and problems, right? And so myself and, and my, my friend Chris Alice, like we did this like really cool research, at least I thought it was cool, into cars and how you could kind of like attack them and make them do things that turn the steering wheel and break them, you know, make the brakes turn on and stuff. And, and we gave this talk and I was very proud of this talk. And almost the first thing someone would say when they'd see this is like, well, sure, like anything can happen. I was like, oh my god, you're right, but it was hard, and it was really cool. Like, why can't you respect that it? it was so cool? So just tell me how, like, well, sure, anything can hack. So it turns out it's like, the fact that anything can hack is not fun for anybody. Um, and so now when I go to security conferences, this is what I do. I don't do the talks anymore, I just hang out. <laughs> um, the other lesson is, and, and most of you probably know this, is that, like, people are like, well, you know, compliance, 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 and, like, everyone has to do their, 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 their go. You want a picture of me, Chris? <laughs> no, you got it. I just sent it to you if you want. So, uh, so anyway, so compliance is like not the solution. Like it's like, okay, well, what are we gonna do to solve this problem? Well, we'll make rules and laws, and, and this hasn't worked at least so far, because uh, as we know, like you see, Manning is this company that a lot of people call and they clean up after they act. Um, and every single company in, in a year span that, that they got called in for was actually a piece of compliance at the time of, of the attack. So. It didn't help them. More on this, like, so Target was totally within uh, PSAC compliance at the time of their drug breach. So compliance and rules about about protecting yourself isn't going to make much of a difference. And this is, like, one of the more depressing articles I've ever read, is, uh, like, a lot of the times I think about, like, well, who's attacking, you know, me, and who's attacking, you know, who I'm supposed to be protecting? And uh, it's like, well, yeah, if China or the NSA or someone breaks into your system, it's like, well, you know, what are you going to do? Like, those guys are tough. Um, but like, when like, the teenagers in, you know, Ukraine or something are attacking your computers and succeeding, like, come on, we can be better than that. Like, we're not that competent, I hope. So uh, this is, like, really depressing that it says two-thirds of, of web attacks, whatever that means, is, uh, is just for fun. It's well, it's for non-financial gain, which so anyway, like we, we have to improve. Um, the other thing is, uh, a lot of the rest of this talk is about like a particular passion of mine, which is vulnerabilities. Um, and so, like, it turns out that we're really bad at finding vulnerabilities in software. And a lot of this talk, or a lot of this conference, is really about how to do that and how to organize that sort of thing. So anyway, so there's been a lot of examples, especially recently with like. And bash and, and very shell bugs and stuff. But this is one that happened you know, within the last year and a half that really, really uh, depressed me. So this one is about uh, X, which is like the window manager for Linux. And uh, the, the reason that that had a particular sore spot for me is because sometime back in like 2003, maybe so like 10 years before this, I personally audited this code. And so, like, I did find bugs, but I, I, I didn't find them all. So if you look closely, like, there was a stack overflow, and it would allow, you know, some sort of code execution. And, and this thing, this bug was introduced in 1991. So, like, I, there probably people who weren't even born yet when this bug was introduced. And, and it's, it's open source, like, everyone can read it. It's all, you know, all more eyes on the problem. But this bug was in code for so many years, I don't know if I can do the math. It's like... 15 years or something, right? Stack overflow, most simple kind of bug, in the code 15 years, people like me have audited it, we missed it. It's just like, what are we gonna do? You know, it's, it's like such a drag. <laughs> so, uh, so why why are we such failures? Um, so there's, there's a lot of reasons, and I'll go into a, a bunch of these more in a bit, but um, I, I more or less block it off into these four major points, so. Uh, we all use insecure products, and I'll say why we're insecure in a bit. Um, so, so making secure products is expensive, and the most important thing is there's no way to really tell which products are secure and which ones are. And then, of course, there's this whole like defender's dilemma, which is uh, you know it only takes one mistake for the attacker. But, you know, so we have to be, defenders have to be perfect, and attackers just have to be perfect. 
Yeah. So before we go into that, let's just talk about bugs and vulnerabilities and you know why they exist and and you know who uses them and that sort of stuff. So um, so uh, do they mention zero day and movie hacker? Do they use that phrase? They don't use that? They don't use that? Oh man, that's cool. So uh, so most most people in this room know. So zero days are essentially vulnerabilities where there's no patch up. It's new. Uh, there's nothing nothing uh, there's, there's the very little you can do as a defender against these sort of attacks. I mean, this is like, okay, you're talking about bug mines and try to find all this information, and you can find other sort of ways. But the point is that, that there's vulnerabilities in software, we don't know what they all are. Um, so, like, why, why would you use one? Well, if you were a bad guy, you would use one because uh, you, you're attacking a target that, that patches those systems. Um, so the, the, the one of the, the other points to take is not all zero days can be are just bad, right? They're not bad inherently. Like sometimes they can be used for good. So for example, in the matrix. In the matrix they did use it for good. And of course, like we say all mankind did zero day uh, against the, some sort of Apple product that was in a spaceship or something. I don't remember the detail, but definitely zero day was used, definitely it was very good. But mostly they're used for evil, I must say. But sometimes. So uh, who uses zero days? Well, you know, my testers sometimes, bad guys use it from bad stuff. Uh, corporations maybe, uh, governments, there's no way to know, but uh, you know, we kind of maybe think that. Um, so so here's some, some other sort of like, just little fun antidotes about zero days. So there's this uh, researcher named Raven, and her quote is, zero day can happen to anyone, because she was giving a talk, Stuff right now, and someone hacked her computer and, and made these silly stuff right now while she was on the stage. And uh, like, as a, an instance of like how totally stupid most people who attend uh, security talks are not you guys, you're the exception. <laughs> <laughs> typical security conference attendee, everyone made fun of her for years, right? Oh my god, I can't believe someone hacked your computer while you're on stage. You're such an idiot. You don't know how to do security. And she's like, well, it can happen to anyone. And she's totally right. Like, it can totally happen right now. Right? There's, I, I, I'm not special. I have a computer and it runs software that some, some people in, you know, Cupertino wrote. And they're not necessarily the most competent security engineers. And so there's no doubt you could break into my computer right now if you, if you really tried. And so I just bring this up because I feel totally terrible that she got such a bad rap and she was totally right the whole time. So here's another uh, quote. Dave Vitale says um, his company sometimes purchases zero days from researchers, so you can use them for uh, whatever they use them for. Um, and so his thing is like, well, someone asks him, like, like, if you buy one of these things and then once someone talks about it, it's not worth anything because it's not a zero day anymore. And he's like, well, sometimes you can get burned. Sometimes not. So anyway, just sort of interesting perspective on things I thought. And then my famous quote about zero days is, uh, I won phone bill in one year, um, and I had two bugs actually. Uh, so I won with one, and the other one I just kept for another year and won the next year with it. <laughs> so, like all good researchers, I sat on So, the, the, sort of the, the point, besides my awesome Heisman pose, is that, like, what was the incentive for me to report two bugs when I had two bugs instead of just one? And there was no incentive. The incentive for me was to wait a year and win the contest again. <laughs> so, uh, like, we need to start thinking about how to incentivize people like me and you to record bugs when we find them instead of just sitting on them and, and, and like, collecting them, like, I don't know, troll dolls or something. Okay. <laughs> so, um, one thing, like, being a security researcher is fun because I'll take a product like, you know, Adobe Reader or Office or something, and I'll fuzz it and I'll find a bug, and ha ha, you guys are ready to tap on a bug you can find, right? It's great fun. Uh, but now that I actually work for a company that is, you know, my job is to find bugs and stop people from doing that to me, it's not quite as fun and, and it's harder. Because <laughs> it's like, okay, well, before I just had to find one bug, and now I have to find, like, all the bugs, and that's a little harder. And there's this article where Microsoft talks about how long they run their fuzzers. And I used to, like, make fun of this endlessly. Was, I found it so funny that they had this thing where they say uh, they run it for 500,000 iterations. That means they run their, their fuzzer 500,000 times, essentially. And I was like, well, why that number? You know what I mean? And it's like, if I worked at Microsoft, what I would do is I would write a really bad fuzzer that never caught any bugs, and then I know for sure when it hit 500,000, which it would, because it doesn't have bugs, I'd be better. 
right? I was like, oh, they're idiots, you know. Like, they're incentivized to write bad puzzles in that kind of books. And then I worked at a company, and I was like, okay, I wrote this puzzle, I'm going to turn it on. It's like, when do I turn it off? I don't know. Dude, I don't know. So I was like, 100,000? Sounds good to me. <laughs> so anyway, now that I've sort of seen the other side of things, I can understand why there's these kind of rules, even though they really don't make a whole lot of sense. Anyway, the point is it's hard to find. Which, which, which reminds me of a story about me at Black Eyed 2011. So there's me with a little more hair on my head. And this is Brad Arkin, who works at Adobe. So we were hanging out, like, at, at, by then I had stopped going to actual talks at conferences. And we were hanging out at the pool, and I said to him, uh, hey, Brad, I was working at a consulting company at the time. I was like, hey, Brad, you need to hire us. Like, I'm good at finding bugs. I'll find a bunch of bugs in Adobe Reader and Flash or whatever it was I was trying to put myself out for. And he says to me, Charlie, uh, we, don't, we don't need to find any more bugs. We're done finding bugs. We don't care about bugs anymore. I was like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? He says, uh, we're going to build the sandbox thing, and uh, we're not going to worry about bugs. Because you can find 10 bugs, you can find 100 bugs, it's not going to help us. There's thousands of bugs in our products. For <laughs> 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 real? Like, you know what, you're not going to look for bugs anymore? He's like, no, I'm not looking. We're going to build the sandbox. And I was like, you're crazy. So 2011, I left Black Hat. I thought Adobe was crazy. It turns out later on, he was totally right. So uh, what they did was they built the sandbox, and uh, you know. So at the time, if you remember back in 2011, everyone was hammering like Flash because that was everyone hammered IE and browsers and stuff for a while, and then that got hard. So then everyone started plug, uh, like nailing, you know, these sort of third-party plugins like Flash because that was easier. And then you know, we built the sandbox, and what made what it meant was yeah, there's still tons of bugs in Flash, but. You couldn't really exploit them very easily because you would need like two bugs and they had sandbox discovery. So then hackers being as they are lazy people, they just were like, well screw that, we'll do something easier. So they moved on to Java or something else, and then they moved on to whatever else. And so the point was, he was right. He just made it harder to where the hackers moved on to find other targets. Which sort of lends the question, like, if you work at a company and your software has bugs, like uh, what is the effect of finding a bug? So if you have a bug bounty program, and someone reports a bug, like what happens? So your software either looks like the one on the left or the one on the right. Either you've got just like a few bugs floating around, you've done a really good job in Charlie and bugs, or you've got this thing on the right that's full of bugs, like the flash. And the question is, uh, what happens when you fix one of these bugs? And so like, if you fix one of the bugs on the left, like you've done a great job. Like you nailed like a third of the bugs are gone in most people. But if you fix this bug and you really improve security, I mean, you, technically you've improved it, but not really. Like, it's still super easy to find a bug. And it's still like, going to be easy to, to, to exploit it, probably. And it just really took, uh, as an attacker, it really takes no more resources to attack this product, whether this bug's fixed or not. So it, it starts to make you think about, like, what, how much effort you put into fixing bugs should, have to, should be sort of a function of how many bugs are in your software. So uh, what are some examples of code like this? Well, my favorite low density software, bugs, uh, low density, software that has low density bugs, how about that, is Apache. So Apache is a uh, you know, web server, it's very well written, it has very few bugs, and I personally look at it and it's very tough to practice. I'm not saying there's no bugs. There's no, you know, maybe tomorrow there'll be a remote in Apache. I doubt it. Um, and then you look at something else like FFmpeg, which is something that uh, is inside a lot of software, like I think uh, it was mentioned it's a Chrome actually, so it's a video player. Some guy recently fuzzed it for two years, found 1,000 bug fixes, right? So it's like, obviously there's a ton of bugs there. Do, do I think that there's only 1,120 bugs in that software? No, I think there's way more than that. But the, the fact is, he fixed a ton of bugs, right? So there's definitely software out there that has lots of bugs, and there's software out there that has hardly any bugs. And you have to ask yourself, should you behave differently in those two situations? So just to show you, this is just an example of, of uh, uh, a Google search I did. So if you search for like when the last time there was a heap overflow in Apache in the main HTTP D module, so there's this one. But if you Google that, the first thing you see is something in some module that doesn't really count because not many other people have that running. This one was in 2009, this was in 2002, 2009. So there was one in 2009, I don't think there was ever even an exploit for it. The last time I think there was an actual exploit for Apache, 2002. You know, that's 13 years ago. If you can have 
a software from 2002 and you put it, or 2003, say, and I just put it on the internet, it's going to be safe. Like, that's pretty impressive. So, given the right circumstances, it is possible to write functional software that's pretty secure and, and easy to attack. Um, and Apache is an example of that. So, here's a, a smart guy who actually gives good keynotes, so you uh, should have invited him. Um, <laughs> So his, his idea is that uh, about this whole problem of, of you know, when to fix bugs and then that. It was that he says, like, fix all the bugs, no matter what. And that uh, it's hard, people should get paid for it. I agree with those points. And then he has this interesting idea that the US government should just buy all the bugs. And his idea, and, and he's right that they have plenty of money to do that. That if, he just, if they just would say, any time you find a bug, an offer from anybody, We'll pay you 10 times that. And if, if that happened, they would, I think he's right that in some software, all the bugs would drive pretty quickly. So it's an interesting idea. It's a game here. Um, but, and then on the other side of, of, of sort of the, the idea is there's this academic paper by Matt Blazin and some of his, uh, his folks. And they say that the length of the period after the release of software product and before the story of the first is primarily function of familiarity. It's, so another non-academic way to say that. Is that it's not about code quality, it's about whether people look at your code. So like uh, if I write code and no one looks and you know only two people look at it, they're not gonna find many bugs. But if I write code and it turns out now this code is gonna be inside every iPhone on Earth, and everyone that's looking at it, they're gonna find a lot of bugs. And so it didn't have to do with how well the code was written. But it really, or whether I used the SDLC, or whether I used Fuzzing, or whatever. What it really mattered was how, how attractive it was to me. And I think that's true. So it sort of asks the question, like, what do you do? If you have software that is, has tons of bugs, what's your strategy? Well, um, you can find bugs pretty easily, but it doesn't help you much. So, so like, what do you do? Um, on the low that's bugs, if you find bugs, it's awesome. It really helps a lot. Um, but it's hard, right? So you might look for a long time and not find anything. So that's for you to decide what to do. But if it was me, what I would do, if I had if I had the software that had hardly any bugs, I would look for bugs and try to fix them. And there's really no other else do. If I had software that had tons of bugs, I would take the Brad Arkin approach. Be like, screw it. Like, we'll look for bugs just for kicks, but like I know it doesn't help much. I'm gonna go like a whole different route. And I'm gonna try to like make exploitation difficult and do some other sort of thing, something I can engineer and measure to try to make the software better instead of just trying to fix all the bugs because it's just too So I think that was a really smart approach. Um, the other thing is, you, if you eventually find enough bugs, like the FFmpeg example where they found 1,100 bugs, if you eventually you'll drive up that, you know, dry up all those bugs, right? Eventually you'll make it, there'll still be a ton of bugs, but they're gonna be really hard to find. You'll have used all the techniques everyone uses, and so, like if you just turn a basic buzzer on, it won't work anymore. So you can make it harder. You can take high density software and try to like move it into this low density category, but it's really tough. So hopefully you just don't have it. Alright, so uh, this is a, a tweet. If you notice this, this talk is just random. I'm sorry. Uh, it, I was I was I was telling Chris earlier that I used to give this talk, something like this talk, a while ago. It was very well organized. And then, like every so often, I'm like, oh, I should talk about that. Or I should talk about that. And so instead of like restructuring the talk, I just like stick in random spots. So anyway, apologize for that in advance. Um, anyway, here's a tweet that I saw the other day, or maybe a month or two ago, January 3rd. So this is here. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the guy who did like that cool uh, Cosmos Part Two show. So he says uh, Obama authorized North Korean sanctions over summer. Having a solution there, it seems to me, is to create unhackable systems. So Twitter just went crazy, right? At least in my little corner of Twitter where I hang out. Everyone was just like totally bashing this poor guy, right? <laughs> so, they were like, I'm going to go to poop money, yeah, okay. And then this guy's like, hey, nerd, go away. You don't know what you're talking about. And then this person says, like, well, let's build the plan on black box, which is actually pretty funny. But um, <laughs> the point is, like, everyone's hating on him. And it was like me and like one other nerd in the corner who like was like, well, like, I don't know, I don't think that's a terrible idea, right? So, what is our goal? Like, if we're not trying to create unhackable systems, what are we trying to do? Like, make hackable ones? Like, 
I don't really get it. So like, that is our goal, right? We're trying to keep the bad guys out. So like, let's do it. You know, like let's instead of spending our time training our users, which is a you know a waste, or <laughs> I mean, really, are you gonna trust a user who wakes up at 2 a.m. and like is like on their email to do the right thing? No, it's stupid. No, they're not gonna do the right thing. So you need, I mean. Instead of doing that, let's take a technological solution, that's what we do for a living, and make it hard to break into systems. Yeah, I think it's reasonable. So anyway, uh, way to go. Stick with Cosmos, but I, I support you on this particular issue. Please. So uh, the point is, like, let's do it. Like, we can, uh, I know it's hard, right? And no one said it's easy. But if we're not working towards that, what are we working towards? All right, so uh, back to the organized portion of the talk. Uh, Let's talk about why the products we use are insecure. And this is basically what really sort of gets us in the end anyway, is like, like I mentioned, I'm not some, some you know, super hacker, I'm a scorpion, I'm just some guy who has a MacBook. And if, if my software has flaws, everyone's software has flaws, and you can break into my computer just as easy as you can break into any of So uh, So let's talk about why these vulnerabilities are here in the first place. So, so the, the point is, like, it's, it's hard, right? We all know it's hard to write software that doesn't have bugs. Um, it takes time, it takes money, you know, it slows down development, all this kind of stuff. And uh, the general perception is, like, well, we need new features, that's right? New software, get it out the door. And, and that's what developers care about, right? And that's what managers really care about. And, and we're just trying to slow them down as much as we can and make it as secure as possible before it hits out the door. Um, which is fine, right? Um, the problem is when it comes to like measuring security. So, like, if you gave me the choice between like I could use uh, you know web browser A and it's going to cost me ten dollars um, and it's like a piece of crap, or you can I can use web browser B and it's a hundred dollars, it's super secure. It's like, well, you know I have probably use A, but at least I have the option to use the secure web browser and pay more. Um, but the the point is there's no such thing in security, right? So like. Microsoft says, hey man, our browser is super secure. We have SLC, we have Plasma, we have blah, blah, blah. We have Microsoft Research. And then, like, you know, we have people come up here on stage and talk about how secure Chrome is while well, we design it to be, you know, secure from the beginning and it has separate processing. And like, right? And then it's like, okay. Uh, and then Safari is like, well, it works. It just works, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the point is, every company says they're probably secure, and there's no way really to tell which, you know, who's full of it and who's not, right? Uh, and even like experts can't necessarily tell whether one product is more secure than the other without spending you know a year or something. And even then, you don't necessarily have, have like real measured, measurable metrics or whatever. You have just sort of like, well, this code looks kind of tough. So the fact that you can't you can't measure security means that there's no incentive for vendors to actually make their product secure, right? So why should I spend a million dollars making my product secure if you're not even gonna tell them that I spend a million dollars? Right, I'll just say it's secure, and what are you going to do? You, so, uh, companies are not incentivized to make their products especially secure. And so, uh, if you ask me this question, hey, Charlie, which is more secure, Microsoft Office or OpenOffice or LibreOffice or whatever the latest incarnation is? Like, I could guess that it's Microsoft Office, but I can't say for sure. And same thing with, like, if, if I'm going to go and I'm, I'm willing to pay a premium for the most secure website, because I don't want to have to get a new credit card every month like I do now. Like, I would use the more, I would pay 10% premium on the website that's going to sell me a book or, or that's actually secure. Like, I can't tell whether Amazon and Borders is more secure. I don't know. Like, you know, only they know, and, and even they probably don't totally know. So, the fact you can't tell which is secure means you can't sort of build that into the price, and that means that there's really no reason for them to, uh, to like, actually, you know, spend the money to do that. Because after all, at the end, like, Suppose Microsoft or Apple or someone makes a product that has a bug in it. Uh, then what happens? Well, uh, you know, there's a bug, and maybe I get owned, and like, ah, oh, the stupid computer has malware on this ring I mean, this is just how we live, right? Like, we're used to that. And if some company gets compromised, how are you gets compromised, and we find out it was because there was some, you know, a zero day attack or something, uh, well, it's like, oh, well, you know, what can I well, there's, there's not really any consequences, right? So vendors make insecure products, we use them, and nothing bad ever happens to the vendors, at least. 
And so, just to like research more proof of this, like again, like I'm sort of a the closet economist. Um, so I thought back about like the coolest exploit that I ever wrote, which was this one where I could send you a text message and I could take over your iPhone. So I was like, well, you would think like that was totally in the newspaper that day, and I bet you that, like all those. Apple investors were like, sell, 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 Apple's going down. <laughs> well, of course, that's just my fantasy world. In real life, uh, the stock market, or uh, the stock continued to go up like it always does for Apple. So, <laughs> my, like, super, like, this is the pinnacle of my career, is finding this particular vulnerability and exploit. No effect at all on Apple stock, if anything, it helped it. <laughs> um, likewise, it's not just Apple, it's even Microsoft. So, like, this is way back in time, 2001, I don't know if you remember, it was it was like before anyone really had like you know, firewalls at their house or, or consumer routers or whatever. So they just went crazy to go over everyone's computer. I think like some people said it took on the power grid in the East Coast or whatever. It was nuts. Uh, it happened in that very, you know, valley. The next day, just the stock started going up, never went back down. So it's like, okay, companies make instant products cause huge havoc and uh, nothing bad happens. So, uh, you know, if, if I was a rational company and I saw this, like, why would I send money to make a secure pack? Well, what's the point? Like, I could save that money and give it to my shareholders and they'll be with them. Um, so, so what can you do? Well, what you can do is if you do have some money for your security budget, which hopefully you have a little bit, you can at least make it harder, right? So uh, you're never going to be able to keep everybody out, but you can at least think about who is actually your, your threat? Who's going to be attacking you? And can you keep them out? All right, so like, you're not going to keep out the NSA no matter how hard you try. Um, and this comes from your own uh, So, uh, but what you can keep out is those kids who are just doing this for fun, right? So, so think about that. Don't, don't spend all of your resources trying to keep out these nation state attackers because you're not going to do it anyway. Spend the resources against the attackers that you actually, you know, are actual threat to your enterprise. Um, so this is just another example of, of you know, companies, vendors are going to do what vendors want to do to to maximize their profit. They're companies. They're trying to make money. They're not trying to make friends or, or you know, making a happy sunshine place. So, you know, Apple's going to do things like uh, let the Chinese government look at their their code. Cool. Like you know, that's what's in their best interest. They're going to do things like kick poor little security researcher Charlie Miller out of their uh, you know, development team. So I can get that too. So because like even though uh, I'm trying to help them, they it's not really a help for them because it's like bad for this, right? A real help for them is if, if someone says like, I'm gonna buy a bunch of your stuff, which kind of does, or they say like, you're the best. Like they, that's a big help for them. Me saying like, you're not the best, you have problems, it's not the best for them, so they don't like that. So we, we can't really count on vendors to do the right thing because they are trying to make money and the best way to make money is not necessarily to make really super, super products. So normally when you have situations where corporations can't be trusted to do you know, the right thing in our own best interest, then you have to make laws and bring the government in. Um, but right now there are no laws that talk about you know, secure products or you know, what you have to do or uh, anything like that. And it's like, well, I know. Uh, we'll get all the security researchers together and we'll lobby Congress. That's like the stupidest idea ever. Because lobbying takes money and corporations have a lot of money and security researchers have almost no money. So we're not going to be able to win that way. Uh, and the other thing that would be like, like really awesome is the reason that I can plug in my toaster and my microwave and know that it's not going to burn my house down is because there's this thing called the Rose Laboratory and they have to test all electrical devices to make sure that they're safe. And so it'd be cool if there was some sort of like certification like that for you know software too right so it's like well it's, and before you put your refrigerator online it's got to at least be looked at by you know this group who says like oh yeah you don't have like little you know shell command injection on every one of your interfaces or something right so it'd be nice if there was some sort of body to this but right now there isn't uh well you know if you were like a total hawk you could say like, well the military will help us um but of course i don't know if anyone believes that the main issue is like vulnerabilities. Like it'd be nice to fix them all, but if you're the if you're in the military, it'd be even better to just like board them all on the attacker. And so uh, it's not like the the fact that vulnerability information is dual use is, means that you can't really trust the military to necessarily be going to attack They like to keep those. 
So perhaps our savior will be, uh, you know, our final hope is the free press. And they're going to come out and they're going to, like, you know, show us the truth and, and get everyone rallying behind their software and we're all going to, like, you know, win from that. So the problem with that is that they're not necessarily also motivated to, like, make this, the world a better place. They're motivated to, like, sell newspapers or, in my days, get people to click on their ads and stuff. So, like, you're not going to see, like, all these headlines, like, new Chrome. Fire our new Chrome uh, sandbox even more effective. Is that going to be like a, the leading story? Probably not. Or SDLC at Microsoft improved. Like <laughs> not uh, you know selling headline. I wouldn't click on that article. It sounds like, super boring. Um, <laughs> but like if you're going to like talk about like these new theoretical attacks that are never going to actually happen, like I mean, that's kind of exciting. I'm going to look at that. So here's like some of my own favorite, um, you know, thought or whatever. So, uh, like, we got NSA's own hardware and backdoor who may still be a problem from hell. I wonder, like, who actually gave that quote, but anyway, <laughs> it's like, probably not my biggest personal concern that my, like, links is routed at my house is in backdoor than the NSA. Like, I have a lot more, uh, things to worry about than that. And then there's these articles, like, I love these ones about, since I do mobile security, I did for a while. Uh, so mobile, and, I, and these are old articles, I did that on purpose because now we have, we can look back in retrospect and see how. So these are in like January 2013 saying, you know, mobile attacks are really going to happen in 2013, it's going to be horrible, we're all going to like, our phones are going to catch on fire, I don't know. But now we can look back and what happened in 2013? Mm, there were like breaches and stuff, but it wasn't because of mobile phones, right? So like, uh, mobile attacks didn't really happen and they're still not really happening. They didn't happen in 2013. And now it's 2015, it didn't happen in 2014 either, right? So they were off by two years, and for the indefinite future, uh, there's all these articles that get you scared about stuff that aren't really like real threats. And of course, like, if you run an enterprise and you're worried about like your TVs, uh, you really have sort of missed the boat. And so part of the, the problem with this is these, these so-called stunt hackers. Like, these guys are the worst. <laughs> so, uh, there's these jackasses over here. <laughs> the world's best stunt hacker? Oh, uh, what an ass. Oh, wait, that's me. Um, so anyway, uh, and the, the reason that these guys exist is is because, like, I don't know, like, we just, researchers, like, we just do this for fun, it's a hobby, so why not have fun with it, right? And, and, you know, I'm not trying to solve the world's security problems. I'm just, like, goofing on. And uh, <laughs> this is why, like, I'm not really helping uh, and why security hasn't, one reason why security hasn't proved in 2007 is because I'm just doing it for kicks. And newspapers really, like, eat this up because, like, people want to hear, like, oh, my God, my car's going to get hacked. And you would, like, people literally email me out of the blue. Charlie, I read your article. Like, I think my car's been hacked. What should I do? <laughs> and literally, I'll send back one sentence to them that says, your car has not been hacked, Charlie. That's all I say. <laughs> and because it's it's hard, it's not a real threat, and they'll write back, no, 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 Charlie, like, I haven't even told you about my car yet. Like, you don't even know yet. And I'm like, no, I know. Your car's been hacked. Charlie. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> and then I'll be like, I'll be like, maybe you should talk to Chris. And then I'll email Chris. Chris is like, dude, like, he was emailing me before he emailed you. So, <laughs> anyway, the point is, like, this is sensational, it's fun, but it's not really helping, like, security. It's, I mean, because car attacks are real, in a sense, but this is, like, a, something that's happened, like, 10, 20 years on the road. It's not happening, like, that. So here's some more, uh, like, shocking, uh, articles that have been in the press that I, I hate to admit that I caused. So, um, so these are about me and my research, and again, none of these things, while they were fun and exciting and gave good talks, really affected anyone, right? So these are not real attacks, these are just attacks that are sort of fun to talk about. And so, and it's fine, like it's like reading a, a trashy romance novel. Like, it, you know, it, it's, it's not hurting anybody, but like, if, don't, you know, think that's real, and don't, you know, arm your, your whole world around the, you know, the, the reality of, of romance. Not that I would ever do that. This is like don't be distracted. All right. So uh, besides sun hackers, so so that's why you can't count on the press to help us out in this situation. So uh, you know the the golden star, the people who are going to have to save the day, lots of research.
So, so what about yeah. us researchers? So, in the past, like we used to do this, like find bugs, like Katie said, because we wanted to put our name in a Microsoft Bulletin. That was that was it. You know, if, if you could do that, you were pretty badass. Um, but now, what happened? Well, like uh, I have a mortgage, I have children. You know, and, you know that private school. They don't take uh, Microsoft bug. Uh, you know, bulletins as payment. So <laughs> I have to actually make money now, and and you know, I'm not alone. So so now researchers are more interested in, in sort of you know, becoming green hats, as we said. So so making money than, than necessarily getting bulletins anymore. So what happens? You find a bug. Cool. What are you gonna do? Well, you can tell a company that might give your name in a bulletin in a security bulletin or. Or they might sue you a little bit jealousy. But and probably you get your name as Sweet Bolton. You could sell it to like ZDI or somebody who will give you like 5000 or something, you know, $2,000, which is pretty good, or a bug bounty program, maybe. Um, or, and it's going to get fixed and the whole world's happy, you're happy, you have some money. Um, or you can sell it to some bad guy or some government or something, and no one's ever going to get that fixed because of you, but you get like a ton of money. And uh, you know we can argue all day about what's morally right or ethical or whatever, um, but the fact is that these are your choices. And so, for me, as someone who like uses software and, and doesn't want to get hacked, it sort of makes me wonder like, why does my security have to depend on what like some kid who found some bug decides to do? Especially when, like you know that kid's gonna take a hundred grand. Who would? Like if I was a seventeen year old, I'd take a hundred grand, no problem. You know, so like internet security should not depend on what these what, what these kids have to do. Um, so we need to figure out a way to sort of incentivize that of those three choices, the one that helps everyone is also the one that, that they want to do because it helps them. So we need to figure out a way to do that. So uh, I'm running out of time, but let me just say that the, you know I'm depressed, and you guys might be sort of feeling a little down on yourselves. <laughs> But there is some good news. There's some hope. Like I have seen some things recently that I think are sort of positive. So uh, Harpley, like everyone was like, oh man, worst bug ever. Or, like I hate information security and stuff. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, this is like this is good. Um, and the reason is because I would be like driving my car and on NPR they'd be talking about Harpley. I was like, whoa, like this is totally mainstream. And that's fine. to be like, oh my god, like this is normally what NPR articles like. Uh, yeah, so uh, hackers have uh, managed to break into all the internet servers in the world with the heart bleed bug, right? So this is what I'm expecting. And instead, they're like, oh, so heart bleed is open source, and this means that everyone can look at it, and this means that everyone has it. I was like, oh my god, they're actually talking about like spiritual topics that have to do with like, security. So anyway, the point is, I was really happy with the way that this was covered because it did talk about actual real issues that are important and that we should all think about. So like, you know, maybe we all should use it. Maybe every website in the world should use it. This is something we should think about. So anyway, that was good. <coughs> the other thing is, like, even though I've been bad mouthing like how bad security is, like, this has actually improved. It's just like, it's hard to measure. So like, there are fewer bugs, even though, again, I can't really measure that. We got sandboxes now, you know, code signing, we got ASMR and all that kind of stuff. And so when I tell people that, and I'm like, people are like, how can we not do phone known anymore? I'm like, well, it's too hard. It's not worth my time to do it. They're like, what do you mean it's too hard? Someone always wins. And I was like, yeah, but the point is that it's harder. And like, it's, it's not worth my time to spend that much effort. And um, so, I, so I made this chart. This is a number of people capable of writing exploits as time goes on, because things have gotten harder. Now, the data from this was taken by uh, me just making it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally, I think, pretty accurate. So, like, like, one, anyone can write a stack overflow, actually, like, super easy. Now, it's extremely hard. That's the point of this chart. So anyway, the point is, yes, there is still someone who can write an exploit, but there's not as many as there used to be. Um, the other thing is that like you see vendors doing smart things, like Symantec now admits that antivirus maybe isn't the bullet, you know, the, the simple bullet that they said it was. I totally agree. Um, you can see like you know money being paid to researchers. So like there was this other fast track, it was awesome. I got paid to do car research and FC research. Or other people got paid to do a bunch of research. It was really great. Um, like I can't imagine doing research for free now after that. Uh, but then of course like good things it, it ended. 
But still, like we saw talks today about how bug bounties are effective and, and they get they pay people and that gets people to research stuff. So this is good, and I see not only are there more bug bounties, but the amount has been going up. So this is just more data on like how bug bounties are actually effective. Um, and so you see like a lot of bug bounty programs, like five thousand is like quite a bit, which is a lot for a lot of people, but like, you know, come on, like we, we all drive Porsches, you know. So like <laughs> that's not so much for us. Uh, but it is going up. And so you see things like you saw uh, you know, Rainforest Puppy, he won 100000 bucks. That's, that's serious money. And so there are some like new prices. As this goes up, I think, you know, I'm very, I think it's very positive when I see the prices going up. So this is again the thing Katie talked about. And, and another thing is like, oh no, prices are going up. And this is, this is sort of the, the actual data of how things have gotten harder. Because as things get harder, you have to pay more to get people to do it. The really sad thing about this graph, the thing that really makes me just like want to probably cry, is I won four times. My four bullet points are one way down the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> drag. Um, the other thing that's happened, and I, I swear I'll be done in like one minute, is uh, people have started saying like, well, we all use this open source software. Maybe we should all chip in some money and, and like get it audited. So I think it's a great idea. And then uh, there's this new tool that that's coming out of some some researcher. Uh, called AFL Fuzz, which I think is like super revolutionary. It's just sort of getting started, and these are all like bugs that come. So I mean, there are some like super positive things that are coming out of, of what we're doing now. It's just that overall, it sort of seems like we haven't improved much, and maybe we haven't improved much, but uh, you know, I'm still here, I'm still fighting, so hopefully you guys will too. So I guess in conclusion, like, we're, not, we're not great, right? You know, frankly, we, we could do better. Um, but there are some, some highlights, and, and we are going to, you know, if we keep going, things are harder. It's just they're not so much harder that you can actually sort of. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks a lot. Woo.